live from LA Comic Con, it's the Nighttime Show! With us as always, our head writer, Matt Walker, America's best friend, Mike Glazer. I'm the voice of the Nighttime Show, Mike Black, our special guest. He is the co-creator of Phineas and Ferb. Dan Povenmiere! Povenmiere. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Boy, did I screw up that pronunciation. <laughs> it's like <But> you... <laughs> we'll handle it right later. And now, Povenmiere. the man who mystifies me so much that his handwriting screwed up this whole intro, Stephen Kramer Glickman! <laughs> I like that you said... <laughs> no, uh, Povenmire... Absolutely the most wrong it could be said. <laughs> Wait, no, no, did no, you no, say no. Papa Meyer? Papa Meyer. Okay, because I asked how it was pronounced, and you said Papa Meyer. There's Pavenmeyer. an N in there, right? I answer to anything. It's, there's an N in there. Yeah, Papa Meyer. That's why it's pronounced yeah. Papa Meyer. Yeah, do you want to see how Steven spelled it? <laughs> I like, do, actually. Papa Meyer. That's what so it came up with. Papa Meyer. See? Papa Meyer. Hello, it's Ben Papa Meyer. Wait, I have to read this. Papa Meyer. This is only the second worst. Uh, spelling of my name. P O V I M I E R E. Hello, I am Dan Povenmire. Yeah. The, the best one I ever got was Pony Mice. Oh. Which is really not that far off when I look yeah, at it. It's, it's like, like three letters are just slightly different. He didn't think, oh, let's break it down phonetically and do it that way. It's, <laughs> what's the most challenging way I can do it for the intro? Povenmire. Pony. I'm, I'm, I'm going to change my name officially to Povenmire. I like that. So that it sounds Even very fancy. Not have You're very it fancy. International I mean, superstar. Yes. That and sounds like the, that sounds like the name of somebody with a ten thousand dollar fridge. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I, but the, that guy definitely has yeah. ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand two ninety nine. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Holy I, shit. I found that out on TikTok because somebody did a TikTok about how much my fridge cost because <laughs> I had it in the background of one of my TikToks. Yeah. <laughs> and, and my first thought was. My fridge costs ten thousand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. That is an amazing, yes, that is an amazing thing. It, it's a, it's a great thing. fridge. I don't. I, I think it's probably yeah. if there's a fridge that's worth ten grand, that's it. It's oh. what it is. And and actually, in that video, he does go on to say, "Does the fridge? That's what these kind of fridge, like the <laughs> counter depth built-in fridges, cost about that much. So, wow. you know." And I didn't care. It's like at the time we were building our dream house, and I just told my wife, "Spend whatever you want to spend on anything." You're the coolest. <laughs> and, uh, You're the like, coolest. But That's she didn't amazing. even ask about that. There, there, there were other things she asked about, like, "Can we spend fifteen grand on this couch or something?" Like that. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. And, and I was like, I, "I told you, just do whatever you want." We like Phineas had done really well, and we, yeah. we it was like, "And we're not going to skimp once we have yeah, you yeah. know, th this thing." So that you know. I was suddenly in that weird mood of just ah, spend money. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I come from I, I come from nothing. We have money now. Just spend it like it's water. <laughs> Does that More couch mine come. Bitcoin or something? Like yes. That? <laughs> yes. How much did you pay for that? You offer them twice that next time. <laughs> I was like, now, how? Uh, what a gigantic monster of a show! Holy crap! It did Does very that, well. And man, it it hits home with a lot of people. Yeah. Why why do you think that is? Why do you think it was so successful? Because it's not like it was the only thing that was on TV no, on Disney no. Channel at that time. Well, I, I think, what were you guys up against? What other shows were? Well, we were. At you know, we're the ones that knocked SpongeBob off the number one perch. Ooh, uh, which, shit. Uh, which, and I worked on SpongeBob. I like all those uh, all, all those people, and 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 I think that's a really good show. But but I think it hit the zeitgeist at the right time on the right channel with the right promotion and stuff. But I think it's also that we made a show that was genuinely nice. We looked around at what, what else was on, on, on TV for kids, and so much of it, all the characters were either jerks or idiots. They were either mean or they were really stupid, and that's where they got oh, the humor yeah. from. And, we, and I thought, I wonder if we can make a show where nobody is genuinely mean to anybody. Nobody is motivated by meanness. Yeah. Nobody says anything mean to anybody. No, we don't get a, jo a joke out of that ever uh -huh. and still make it funny like, you, you know, like somebody who is watching Family Guy would like. That is yeah. this, really challenging. This, this show. And it's really yeah. challenging. And, and, and it, it, be, it became 
very rewarding to do that show because we had to get smarter a lot of the time. Yeah. Rather, because the easiest place to go for humor is say something shocking, say something mean. Yeah. Yeah. And we couldn't go shocking really because we didn't want to do double entendre. We didn't want stuff that, like, our rule was if the adults in the room laughed and the kids turned around and said, why are you laughing? That conversation could not be an uncomfortable conversation, mm -hmm. and right. so and, and and so that's a really it was a really yeah. you know but it made us that's much a better writers. That's a serious choice, yeah. yeah. And and you know and people would come onto the show and and just couldn't get how to do this show. They they they, they were they were like, well, do these characters even have a personality? When I'd say no, they can't say that. It's too mean. They can't say that. It's too mean. And say like, yes, but it's just not the same personality you've written on the last twelve shows you've right. been on. Right. We're gonna have to find something smarter. Matt would have been fired were, on yeah, day I was, one. I was like, this, yeah. Yeah. The one part is that the exact yeah. opposite of everything of all my instincts is how you yes. are successful. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. That's it's, it was the exact opposite of my instincts. To be honest, <laughs> wow. I came from Family Guy to yeah. that show. Holy crap! Uh, yeah. But uh, but it's uh, you know I, I think it really helped. That it was a it was a genuinely nice show. I think the fact that we wrote songs for every single episode, mm -hmm. that I've written 500 songs for Disney at this point, something oh. so, something like that. And, and so do you get like ASCAP royalties on those? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, not ASCAP. I'm in or BMI, whatever. but okay. uh, but uh, but yes. Nice. And they were, but you got to be nice. all over Disney Radio. Yeah, every day. <laughs> we were all over that, and and like TikTok. If you type in the name of any of the songs that I wrote mm -hmm. for that for for that show. It's like millions and millions and millions of views. Some of them have like millions of videos that each have hundreds of thousands so millions of, millions of, views of views on TikTok sounds like now, about twelve dollars. Okay, now wait, wait, wait. Before, <laughs> I don't know before what we mean. jump over to TikTok, we ha I have to say this: not only did you write those songs, you sing a lot of those I songs sing, too. Sing several of them, yeah, yeah. because you're you're. Um, I'm Dr. What? Doofenshmirtz. So. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I sing. Which is well, I'll be honest, I don't really understand, but I fell down this hill, now I got glue on my hands, and I got records on my fingers. Records on my fingers, I got records on my fingers, and I just can't stop. <laughs> that, that song is called Platypus Controlling Me. If you look that up on TikTok, there are five or six different mashups of it with popular songs. Of the, you know, there's one with Train, there's one with Saweetie that had like millions and millions of videos like if you wow. if look under the sound there's millions of videos to that song because there was a dance craze to it and, and, and stuff like that I think we now it's owe like, uh, Disney uh, $7,000 probably for that, probably, <laughs> for that guess, sound yeah. bite. probably <laughs> well <laughs> yeah, you, can just, you, can, you, you can pay me before I leave yeah. <laughs> okay. for, uh, I take uh, I take yeah. cash oh, and no. check yeah uh, I've got a Venmo, so. <laughs> for, for our audience that is uh, listening to this, um, there's a lot of, you worked on a lot of really badass stuff. I mean, fucking, I'm, <laughs> I'm using bad language already. <laughs> Done I mean, some fucking great children's work. I mean, hey, bro, <laughs> really, really fucking, fucking great, great children's work over here. Uh, Cat Dog, The Simpsons. You you worked on The Simpsons? I worked on The Simpsons <laughs> you did, you directed uh, second through like fifth season. So like. 20, when they were at their peak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it when it when it was the biggest show, it, I worked on the Ninja Turtles when it was the biggest show. I worked on the Simpsons when it was the biggest show. And I wor Rugrats. Worked on, I did not work on Rugrats. That's on my IMDb, but That's I wrong? had nothing to do with it. That's wrong. Hey, IMDb. What was your favorite thing Fix on your life. Uh, Ninja Turtles? Uh, Ninja Turtles was that was like my first gig in an actual animation studio. Oh, okay. I had done animated segments for feature films before that, where I had done everything. I was like the producer and the director yeah. and everything. Oh my god. Um, and uh, and then I worked in in house for the Ninja Turtles. I was just really. Big. I didn't have a lot to do with that show. I was just cleaning up storyboards and, and, and restaging stuff and fixing stuff. Right. Um, then I went to The Simpsons and, like, like what's what's something everybody remembers? Do you remember the Busby Berkeley musical? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the Busby Berkeley couch gag where they come yeah. in and it pulls back and the facade <laughs> yeah, the goes whole up. And big thing, yeah. I did all of that. Wow. I storyboarded wow. it and animated it and. Uh, Holy crap. And, uh, and I did like the Mr. Plow. Remember the Mr. Yeah, Plow episode? That name again. Where, where Barney is beating the crap out of the, the Homer thing. That's, a, that's I, me. I used to know a guy in Pennsylvania who had a license plate of Mr. Plow. Yes. That yes. was his license plate. Yes, he actually yes. got it after that. Yeah. And uh, and I did like uh, like uh, itchy and scratchy when 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 the cat's skin gets pulled off by the es <laughs> escalator. And yeah. I, I mean there there were a whole bunch of things that I that, that I did there that I occasionally see there's. There's a, a gif I can paste into people's stuff of of uh, Lisa dancing when she's like stoned. Oh, from that sandwich? 
uh, I think it was like a leftover was, sandwich. It was, from it was a party. something <laughs> at, at a, an amusement park. And yeah, she, she was like, like I can see the music. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I drew that. So it's weird that I can put that gif on people's. Wow. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. my God. So, uh, so yeah. it, it was. Uh, it, that was a great show to work on. I would not have left if I hadn't been offered writing on, on Rocco's Modern Life. I, I went over there just for the break between seasons of, uh, of, the, of The Simpsons. And they were letting me write and draw at the same time, which was sort of what I, you know, what I really wanted to do. I'd, I'd done a comic strip, a daily comic strip before that, and, yeah. and I just showed them my comic strip. And they said, "Oh, somebody who can write and draw, you're hired." And I <laughs> wow. stayed on that for all five seasons. But I, I, I still did uh, did uh, Simpson stuff at night for as freelance. So how did you get started in entertainment in general? Like, is it some, when you were growing up, you like you always used to draw pictures? Or? Well, I I always drew from. I was like a child prodigy artist. I I, I, w I was making a good living drawing uh, pen and ink limited edition prints and selling them in the arts art crafts uh, fairs around the Gulf Coast when I was like twelve. Wow! Uh, Holy! I would go crap. to the jury. <laughs> I would I would go to the juried art shows that a lot of the adults couldn't get into because you uh -huh. have to send in pictures of your of your work, and I would always get in uh, because because I, I just could always draw whatever I wanted to do, to to draw. At the do time. people who, who and, ha might have those now know that what they have in their possession? Sometimes days? people put it up on TikTok and say, "I think this is an original Dan Pavenmeyer," and I'll go, "Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was like wow. I was like 13 when you know, and I drew that." Wow. Uh, uh, but uh, but so I always had been able to draw, but I didn't feel like that's what I wanted to do for a living. When I saw Jaws in the theater, mm -hmm. I was like, yeah. "Oh, I want to make movies. That's what I want to make." And uh, and I and I just started going towards that. You know, I, I used the proceeds from one of my uh, weekends at a at a craft fair to uh, uh, to buy a Super 8 movie you know, sound movie projector and camera and stuff, and I started making movies. And so I came out to go to USC film school, and I never got in, but I took nothing but film classes and then dropped out. So I'm a, I'm a college dropout. <laughs> That's uh, I'm a I'm a cautionary tale. To, could kids stay in school? And. Uh, and uh, and then I started doing caricatures at Olvera Street downtown, oh, wow. uh, because it was something I could do. Yeah. And uh, and I made a living doing that for a while, and still did my comic strip. And then somebody sent me an, an ad for they were looking for Ninja Turtles storyboard artists, and I was like, I could do that. And I just went and applied, and I got the gig. So was that show already on the air at that point? It, uh, I was probably I came in midway through first season. Okay. I think it was already on the air because they did like 60 episodes. I think oh, it was wow. probably 30 <laughs> episodes in or something. Yeah. That came in. yeah, not long after that, you went over to uh, The Critic for an episode. Is that I right? I was on one episode bit? of The Critic. Uh -huh. Oh, my <laughs> I God. Did, I, I, I did. Uh, it was just a freelance gig. I just got uh, to work with Lovitz on a movie. Yeah. And I said, uh, oh, I loved you on The Critic. He goes, well, that's because I'm very good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I loved it so much. Yeah. He's great. No, he's um, great. Hey, uh, before we continue doing the show, I, we got to talk about uh, the, the equipment that we're using mm -hmm. to make the show, uh, make an epic show that is, uh, it sounds like, you know, everyone is right here. Like yep. we're all sitting together, but we're not. We've got a fantastic multi-track recorder from Zoom. Um, yeah. If you need multi-track recordings, that's the only company you should even be looking at. Um, basically, we had issues when we had to switch to doing things during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we, were, we went from doing a show with people in person to people over the phone and zoom just made it a piece of cake yeah you bet zoomcorp.com is the website and uh they're you know th this has made it so that we could interview people in uh nigeria new zealand new zealand um yeah. guatemala um of uh, austria Czechos like the czech the czech republic um, when we were Are doing you just all naming those, countries now? Yeah. Well, no. When we were doing all the interviews with the cast of uh, 90 Day Fiance, we were yeah. talking to people you know, in the, in the Ukraine. Yep. Like, mm -hmm. We were doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And then just the other day when we had uh, John Reese davies on the show. From New Zealand. He was in New Zealand the whole time. Sounded it sounded like he was, like he was sitting in the room with us. Yeah. yeah. It truly is the mark of excellence for podcasting. Zoom, live track L8, 8-track mixer recorder, the board for creators, podcasting, music, and beyond. Yeah, it is a badass system, and uh, we're very lucky to be working with uh, Zoom. Go check out zoomcorp.com. That's zoomcorp.com. 
dot com zoom you have to say it three times that's what people do in ad, ads right zoom, what is it steven zoom corp dot com it's zoom corp dot com we're talking about zoom corp dot com all right let's get back to the show what about uh ren and stippy you went over did you do one I did on that one board of ren and stippy and to my knowledge i think i look I, I think i looked through that board to see what when like, because they were notorious for changing, like, everything. Yeah. I think there was one drawing of mine that made it through. Mm. Holy crap. Because they just changed everything, and I was like, oh, this is completely different. This is completely different. Oh, there. That one drawing that one of these bit. people on a truck was, <laughs> <laughs> like, no, like, 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 made it Well, like, as, a, as a creator of a show, um, yes. you, you know, have gotten to, to be up close and personal with some other very famous creators, like John Kay from uh, yeah. Ren and Stippy or... Um, you know, and uh, Matt Groening. Um, what, Bill Oakley. What, what did you? Yeah. What did you learn from these guys? That did they did it help being around them so that when you were in charge, you kind of had ideas of how you wanted things to be? Yeah. Well. Well. John was. Uh, John was already gone when I did the uh, the did Ren and Stimpy. I'd met him at, at parties and stuff, but I didn't see his leadership style because I wasn't in in the studio at that at that time. Uh, but uh, and Matt was barely there for The Simpsons. He was is sort of over with the writers periodically. But right. but he he, he uh, the people that really shaped how I uh, how I ran things were like Seth MacFarlane and Joe Murray, who did Rocco's Modern Life, and Steve Hillenberg, who did uh, SpongeBob. Oh yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, and what I got from from them, like from Joe and Steve, I got. Let people be as funny and stupid as possible, and take everything that makes you laugh and keep it, and and don't change stuff unless it needs to be changed. Wow! Because you want people to have ownership of the show. Yep. You, you know, like 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 it demoralizes people when they work really really hard and then none of their shit gets through. Wow. Oh, I said shit. <laughs> uh, and uh, sorry, Disney. And uh, and uh, from from Seth. I thought Seth was so smart on, on Family Guy because when I was on The Simpsons, if a show came into what we called animatic, which is like like storyboard panels or, 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 or layout drawings put to, put to the soundtrack, it's like a, it's like a pencil test, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. If it came into that part of the process and it was funny, it, it, and, and, and it's, if it came into that part of the process and it sucked, it mm-hmm. would get great by the end because they had all these times to rewrite it. Yeah baked into their schedule and they would rewrite about 20% of it each of these times and it would and they would elevate really crappy original script to something really great right but if something came in really great at that stage it would get penalized because still they rewriting. would still rewrite it yep. and it would get worse and worse and worse <laughs> yeah and you know like there were things that came in that were uh, to me the funniest episodes of TV I'd ever seen that, that when they went on the air I was like okay you know, it's can you, can it's you think of any like uh, specific examples of something on The Simpsons where like it was great, and then by the time I, it was finished, it just for, wasn't quite the same? I can't remember. There, there, there was one season. It may have been. It may have been Homer. That, no, because that st- that still was really good. There, there, were, there, were, there was one that came in really, really funny, and I can't remember what it was. Mm-hmm. And then it was just disappointing by the time. Yeah, because funny with and Simpsons Seth is wouldn't like, do that. Seth would go. We don't need to touch this. Yep. There's this show over here that we can spend extra time on because Got it. he wow. yeah. had the presence of mind, and, and he and the and the showrunner at the time, who was uh, I think uh, David Goodman, ha- had the presence of mind to know whether something was funny enough mm-hmm. or not without without saying, "Well, oh, have we rewritten this enough?" I remember writing on things where I would see like the older guys not contribute anything for like most of the week. And the younger guys are like thrown out joke after joke after joke. I'm like, why are they even hiring these old guys? And then they would come in on the very last day and go, I had a couple ideas since we were like down to the wire. Yes. And then and they, they go in all and their and they great would, ideas. They would stay in because yep. people wouldn't have a chance to get tired of it. Because that's exactly. the problem yes. is when you hear a joke over and over again, it's no longer funny. Yeah. Do we still yeah. want and, that one joke? And <laughs> that's what I have to do all the time on, on, on Phineas. I always had to go, okay. This joke is not making me laugh anymore. Mm-hmm. Is it because it's not funny, or is it because I've heard it thirty times? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Or sixty times, or mm-hmm. hundred and twenty times, and that's not really an exaggeration. Uh, yeah. 
And uh, I've, I've heard those jokes one frame at a time, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. So I would have to constantly be checking myself and say, is this still funny? Or is it just that it doesn't, it, it, does this need to be rewritten? Does it need to be retimed? Do I need to take out a little bit of, few, you know, like two frames of pause can make a world of difference as right. to whether something's funny or not, whether you get oh, a, yeah. a, a laugh out of it. And, uh, and like, I was constantly having to try to figure out, okay, this made me laugh the first 12 times I saw it. Chances are, since I haven't changed it since then, it's still funny. <laughs> right. Yeah. But the but everybody who is hearing it over and over again have all heard it over and over again. Yeah. The editor, me, so you have to keep like, defending it to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so so it was a constant battle of, of like how did uh, you know when when did this die and why did it die in my mind or is it actually really dead? Is there a difference between something like that and creating these songs for a show where you have to? not touch a song at a certain point because well, now you have. Well, here's, here's the thing with the songs is that we would write the songs we would write, you know, cor- you know, we'd write them on guitar and I would sing them into a garage band thing with like a click track and then we, I would send it to Danny, our composer, and he would produce it and sometimes it would change a little bit in that production he would, he would phrase things slightly different or something and my first initial concept, my first initial thought was always Oh no, that's wrong because it wasn't the way it was in my head. Yeah. You know, most of the time he would nail it. It would be exactly the way I wanted it. But if something was not quite the way I want I, I saw it in my head, I would not give him notes even though he was he's needy and would you know like, "Hey, what'd you think of that? Hey, what'd you think <laughs> yeah. of that?" You know, I get these texts, the text uh, and uh, he's going to hear this and go, I'm not needy. You're, you're, you're needy, Danny. You're needy. And, Just send uh, me 30 texts about how not needy <laughs> yes, you are. exactly. Uh, so, um, so I would live with it and just listen to it over and over again a bunch of t- times for like a day at least. And if at the end of 24 hours that still wasn't as funny to me, then I would have him change it. But a lot of the times... After listening to it a bunch of times, that became how that song was supposed to sound in my sure. head. And it's like, okay, that's not any less funny. It's just different than the way I thought of it. And I always tried to make, I always tried to keep as much of my, my the people who are working under me, as, as much of their vision in the show as possible so that they feel energized to come to work and not, you know, debilitated. Yeah. That's awesome. That makes now, a lot of sense. In animation, uh, the turnaround times often on some of these shows are much longer than they are on uh, yeah. on camera. Stuff, yeah, right? of course. Like Simpsons, it's, like it's like a year from the time they start making an episode. Yeah, that's about, done. that's about right. So how often do you find in animation when you're working on things like this that something in the world happens and you're like halfway through an episode and you're like, you know what, we got to change something because, Damn like for example, like Star Trek Enterprise. We've on, on many different occasions. Yeah, like Star Trek Enterprise the, debuted yeah. right before 9-11. Yes. And they went back and had to rewrite the second half of the first season because yes. like they changed what they were going to do with it. You know, yes. Matt, you, you started that question and I was like, what a brilliant, great <laughs> question. And then, and then you did a Star Trek reference. <laughs> found a way. Because you had to find a way you to bring up Star find Trek. A way to get <laughs> every episode. You my, <laughs> one of, of one of my favorite TikToks. The, the TikTok I almost <laughs> sent you for the for the for the reel was me telling the story of my wife, who's younger than me and and from Venezuela and doesn't get the same pop culture mm-hmm. con- things. In a ha- in a car full of uh, animation geeks, going to, going to food, food, and we're like, we should go to Shatner Sushi. You guys want to go to Shatner Sushi? And they go, yeah, okay, let's go there. Which is what we called this restaurant that she'd been to several times. She goes, why do you call it that? No, that's not the name of that restaurant. And I said, oh, because because William Shatner's always eating there when we go. <laughs> and she's like, who's William Shatner? And the and the cacophony <laughs> of what? How is that possible? <laughs> Okay, they also, were like, he's, he played Captain Kirk. And then she said, who's Captain Kirk? <laughs> and, and it was over. Well, I have a follow-up question, uh, which yes. is, where is that sushi place? Because I want to go eat it's, there so I can see William Shatter eating sushi. Uh, That's uh, <laughs> I don't know that he's still there. That this, this was 20 years ago. Oh. Uh, but but he, it felt like he must live right around there. Kazu Sushi on on Ventura. Okay. I just I'm doubled, adding on my list. I just doubled their occupancy. It's probably. on the list. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's not, it was not our favorite. So we st- sort of stopped going there because Katsu Ya opened and suddenly okay. that was yeah. much better. So. I, uh, but that, but it was a good it was good sushi. I don't and Katsu has actually sponsored this podcast in the past. Did they it really? have. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever Fantastic. met Shatner? 
Uh, I have not. I've, I've eaten next to him on several different occasions. I met him twice. Uh, he's a real <laughs> son of a bitch. That's, uh, I've heard that a bunch. Yeah. First time I met I him, I, I walked over. We were talking, and I was very excited, and I said, I'm so excited to meet you. Uh, and, and I said, hey, do you mind if we get a picture? And he said, no, meeting me is enough. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Matt, before we continue doing the show, mm-hmm. we got to talk about what we're talking into. These Sennheiser microphones are fantastic. Yeah, they are literally top of the line. The best company in the world when it comes to microphones, headphones, audio equipment like this. I mean, yeah. it's just so damn good. If you want to sound good talking into something, get yourself some Sennheiser microphones. Yeah, it makes you sound epic. Mike Black, uh, say something epic. Space. The final frontier. These are the voyages. Um, If I say any more, lawyers will get involved. (laughs) Here we have to. (laughs) Exactly. But But I said it clearly and you you can hear it clearly. God, I can hear it. It sounds perfect. Um, Hey, uh, go and uh, go check out Sennheiser. If you are looking for audio equipment, uh, you're looking for a great microphone, this is the one to use. Mike, uh, Matt, what is what's this one called that, that we're using? Uh, this is the MD42. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah. It's absolutely perfect. Find them at Sennheiser.com. You bet. All right, let's get back to the show. Uh, some uh, of our TikTokers are leaving the booth now. Yeah. They are. They are lovely TikTokers. Yes. They did a wonderful job today. Yes. Uh, I realized that the three TikTokers to my right on that panel... Mm-hmm. If you added all their ages together, it was less than my age. <laughs> <laughs> that's a true math. That is so that's a, yeah, that's, that's true. true math. I mean, Holy <laughs> crap. My favorite was one of the guys on, on the panel today. We did, Today, for everyone that's listening, we did a, a panel today about TikTok. Which with, may or may not have already aired by the time you're hearing yeah, this. Yeah, we had 14 sure. <laughs> TikTokers on the panel and around 70 million to 100 million followers in total. Of cumulative, around, something like that. Cumulative. Yeah. It was pretty intense. It was a pretty intense panel. Yeah. Um, but but uh, there, what's the, the point of what I'm trying to say is uh, – is is uh, you you're you have a giant following on TikTok, I do. man. It's, I mean, it's it weird. is. Yeah, and it's not like I mean, I know a lot of other show creators. None of them have followings on TikTok. I don't. You don't see Scott Fellows on TikTok well, with a. Well, I most, mean, God bless Scott Fellows, but he did. He got to he get his ass on TikTok. I do think that most show creators are shyer than me. <laughs> sure, sure. I, 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 uh, I, I, I think that I am a, a much more of a loud social person, and and I think that helps. Yeah. Uh, because I think a lot of them would just like, well, what? I don't know what. I don't want to have the camera yeah, on some me. Some want to be That's like what, they make a yeah. show, so they don't have to be in front yeah. of the camera. And I was always, you know, I was, I was, I was a drama geek in school, and I, did, I played in a rock band for 16 years. You know, really? What, what, kind of, what kind of songs so, did you play? Covers? We, we were, original? we were, well, we, we, we started as a, as a, uh, as a cover band. We would throw our originals in there, mm-hmm. playing around USC for years. And uh, and then we had uh, you know like we put out a bunch of albums and stuff like that, but it was all self-produced, self-distributed. Mm-hmm. We'd just sell them at the gigs. But we had a couple songs that got airplay in sporadic mar- markets around the U.S. But it didn't help us because nobody in Iowa they're not flying uh, you in. Like yeah. well, they don't know. There's no way for them to get our album. It was before the internet. Okay. It was like nobody could possibly get our stuff. So but but we were like one of the big big draws on the Sunset Strip for a while. Very cool. We, we were called Keep Left. Who we else were was? were sort of Bare Naked Ladies before Bare Naked Ladies. Okay. And all the A&R people were looking for the next Pearl Jam. Yeah. Which was not us. Yeah. We were this quirky, crunchy pop band and everybody else was like, Jeremy Smoke. Yeah. No, that's no, that's, that's not, awkward. Yeah, uh, that gets really. I'm just yeah, kidding. <laughs> yeah, so. that is. Uh, that could be. That could be bad. That could be bad. Yeah. So. Um, but where did you guys perform at when you guys? We played at the Roxy and the Whiskey and Club Lingerie and all the you know the all, Rainbow all, all, and all, yeah all all yeah. those places uh, we would play. But we'd also play. I mean, we gigged at least once a week for like. For, so uh, four years. Who's the biggest like that. band that you gigged with? Like, who's the band you gigged with that then became the biggest band? Which of those people? I don't think none of them became bigger than. <laughs> you know, I had. Yeah. Here's the great thing. You're like we were the biggest band. I, I quit. I quit music when I sold Phineas and Ferb because mm-hmm. we just. I, I quit the band at least. Yeah. We um, sold Phineas and Ferb because uh, because I just didn't have any time any, yeah. any anymore. And literally, like a year later, I had an album of songs I had written. 
on the Billboard Hot 100. Really? It like made it to like number Wait. 56. Wow. It was between Pink and Beyonce for wow. a year. Wow. The Phineas and Ferb soundtrack uh-huh. w- made it to the Billboard <laughs> Hot 100. <laughs> Holy I like, shit. I was like, holy sh-. Like, well, like, yeah. like, if I had known that what I needed to do to get an album on the charts was to give up music entirely, <laughs> I would have done that earlier. It's a lot easier. Uh, but, uh, but you know, and that's why all these songs, you know, and that stayed on the on the on the kids charts and the soundtrack charts. It stayed for like ever. It was yeah. like, Disney called it the dark side of the moon because it was their one album that was always on the charts for weeks and weeks and weeks. So, so what's the relationship like with Disney after you have a hit like that? Do do they just kind of like when it comes to the next show, is it as simple as being like I want to do this show and they go, "All right, here you go. Go do it." It was like well, I know that's the dream. <laughs> it was a lot easier to sell right. a, a second show when you have a big hit. Uh, but it was also um, it was at a time where they had, were moving all of their um, uh, all of their cartoons to XD to Disney mm-hmm. XD instead of Disney Channel, right. which nobody knew where that channel yeah. even was, and and they had a lot less money to spend on promotion, and it was like there was a lot less of everything going around for that. So we did our follow up to Phineas and Ferb was called Milo Murphy's Law, which has a very rabid fan base, but it's a very small fan base. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, everybody's heard of Phineas and Ferb. Most people are like, oh, I don't, didn't know that existed. Where was it? So uh, uh, that, that's, uh, that's my that's, that's this fair. girl just walked past and, like, pointed at me and, like, looked like, <laughs> like with, with this quizzical expression on her face, like, I think that's that guy from TikTok. Do you so find that, that a lot now with TikTok, that everywhere you go? I get recognized every, every time I leave the house now, yeah. which is uh, not every time, but almost every time. Uh, and uh, th- but that's just because of because TikTok just made me recognizable. I'm still sort of famous for Phineas and Ferb, even you know, well, even though a lot of, of people talk about my my uh, TikToks when they they meet me. Well, what's uh, so funny is but, it's like look, um, being a, uh, a a beautiful woman that's a cosplayer that you know you know has a uh, led strips in her room yeah. you know you're going to get a lot of followers and there are a lot of very lovely yes, ladies exactly. that way and most of them and that were on is your panel. most yeah. of them I, I, yeah <laughs> yes. most of them were on the panel and i follow all of them yes. but uh, there are not many people on tiktok Doing that are, that that are yeah. our age right, in exactly. in the mm-hmm. in the older age bracket I, I like that you say our age as though we are somewhere similar in age we're we're, <laughs> we're we're in the same i could so be your dad <laughs> to, the, to these kids we're the same age oh yeah. i know i know yeah. to, 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 to them, them it's all the same they have no idea they yeah my, no my idea. favorite was there was a kid on the panel that's what i was gonna say earlier yeah. there was a kid on the panel who was like you know, I just don't want to be like old and you know, like forty and like be <laughs> thinking like I didn't do something. And I was just like, I'm gonna fucking kill this yeah. kid. <laughs> it's like there's that sound where they're like, oh, to all the older generation on TikTok, you know, the ones born in the late '90s, you're and like, you're like, fuck you. <laughs> like you just take your phone and throw it off a bridge. <laughs> they had this. They had this TikTok string where people were talking about how you think I, you're old. I was born in 2005. Yeah. You think you're uh, you're old. I was. Born and, then like, and it went all the way through, like, and then one guy said, all right, kids, uh, you know, step over and let the adults play. I was born in 1981, and I just, <laughs> and I just stitched it, and I just looked at the camera and said, 1981 is when I graduated from high school. <laughs> oh my God. And to yeah. my knowledge, no one has beat me on that on that app. That yet. is so, so great. <laughs> yeah, I graduated first grade in 1981. Yes. I think I'm the oldest on this yes. podcast. Oh, yeah. excellent. Excellent. Till then, but... Uh, so I remember Mount St. Helens. I yes, that. I remember Mount yes. St. Helens. <laughs> oh wow! Before yeah. it blew up. Well, when it blew up. When it blew up. It blew, I didn't. Blew, I didn't know it about up. it before it blew yeah. up. But I wasn't aware yeah, of I, it blew some up. mountain yeah. in a state that I didn't live in. No, <laughs> I didn't care about it until it had the volcano. <laughs> like, I remember but, Mount St. I wasn't a big fan of Mount St. Helens. <laughs> I didn't have like pinups <laughs> of it or anything. <laughs> I remember when Mount St. Helens was like, just it wasn't like a big tragedy to me when it disappeared because yeah. I, cause I liked <laughs> the shape on the top so much. <laughs> Guys, when is the new Mount St. Helens newsletter coming out? You didn't hear, son. You didn't hear. 
You know that this is the Mount St. Helens podcast? That, you know, we're there? We discuss Mount St. Helens. Um, okay, so I got, I got. I had a Mount St. Helens podcast years before it blew up. <laughs> <laughs> Just talking about Excellent. Mount St. Helens. <laughs> um, so it was for big Mount St. Helens. Yes. Oh, that's so funny. Early <laughs> music. I was, up, I was up on these mountains before anyway. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, before we wrap up, um, I want to uh, throw a couple things at you. Um, yes. mm-hmm. Because at me, yeah, I want to. I want to ask. Should I some, have a helmet? <laughs> I've got some IMDb questions okay, for you. Okay. Okay. Here we go. This is what it says on your IMDb. Okay. Is it correct or not correct? <laughs> yeah, let's see. In 1989, you were an animator for Yellow Teeth on the movie no. Going Overboard with Adam Sandler. No, I was not an animator for that. That's I was that. actually in that movie uh-huh. as the as the rhythm guitarist for a band called Yellow Teeth. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, my, I, I had hair down to my belt. I, was, uh-huh. I, was, I, I really looked like a rocker, and a friend of mine was making that movie. And they, uh, uh, and they asked if I would come out and do it. It was Adam Sandler's first movie. But I did animate the opening credits for that and one dream sequence for that. Hell yes, you did. So that's that kind of like how Savage Steve Holland got started, because he yeah. did animation. And do you know Savage Steve Holland? Uh, you know, I have a lot of friends with Savage, but yeah. but uh, but I have never met the man. Yeah. Okay, second question. You have a special thanks on a film called Shrek Forever After. Oh. Do you know that? Did you know that? I don't actually know, but now I want to see if that's true. That's what it says. You also have a special thanks on Rango. I Look can't that. imagine that's true, but maybe. It says, it says it's true. It says that's it's true. Well, it's they, the internet, they also it's say that I worked on Rugrats, which I did not. It well, also well says, the internet says it's true, so I, I believe it. Special thanks. I wonder <laughs> I if that's true. I, did, I w- was executive producer of the Scoob movie. Back in 2020. Yes. Yeah, yeah, last year. That and that, that, that means, awesome. That means I came over f- at lunchtime. Where I was working on Milo Murphy's Law. I would come over at lunchtime and give them notes and ideas and stuff for about six months. And, oh. uh, and then they went ahead for another like two or three years. So I had very little to do with that movie. But there's a lot of stuff That's from when I was of, there that, that made it through. You helped guide the beginning I of the I started process. it. I was, I was going to be directing it if my show hadn't got picked up. It was okay. in second position. Wow. And so when the show got picked up, they said, well, we'll give you an EP credit if you'll come over and, and just give notes. And uh-huh. stuff. So it was a great, it was a great gig because it was, it was not a huge amount of my brain. Mm-hmm. And I got like a credit, like, like I'm on that poster. Yeah, like wow. it's like Chris Columbus and me next to each other. It's, <laughs> Whoa, it's that's, that's amazing! I yeah, love it was that really so cool. much. It was really cool. So, um, in, 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 up next in your life, what do you what do you want to do that you haven't gotten to do yet? There, there's a there's a live action musical script that Swampy and I wrote called Dick! Exclamation point, the musical. It's about a, some guys making a, a musical version of Moby Dick for Broadway. Oh and everything that goes, goes wrong in, God, in yeah. that. I want to see it. And we've yes. written all the, with all the songs and everything like that. And it's, it's really only, and we have like the producer of Lord of the Rings is attached and we, and we have some people interested. There is but, a whale. But we have to get to a point in a my relationship see. with Disney that I can either go away from that or be done and go do go take do a break that. and come back. And I yeah. would love to direct a live action film because that's really why I originally yeah. came out here. I sort of found my people and my tribe in animation, but uh, but I, I that was And Jaws was your thing. inspiration. That was in the ocean and Moby Dick will be in the ocean. That's so. right. Well, uh, <laughs> except not not this one because it'll all be on a stage. Oh, oh, that's true. Okay, yeah. well, Matt, before <laughs> but, but you, still, Matt, before I, I just you make say, the joke, Matt, before you make the okay. joke. <laughs> <laughs> Before you make the joke, are, are you gonna make? I would like joke? to audition for the whale if that's possible. Okay, I, I wasn't I'll, gonna I'll make that joke that. actually. Really? I was just gonna say, Dan, I can't wait to see your dick. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very good. Both, very I, good. both, both count. Yeah, both. Yeah. Count. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. So, um, wait, it is. Can good. I make a pitch? <laughs> yes, of course. Yes. Also, a uh, fifty thousand dollar fridge. A fifty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, this has been. Such a pleasure. This has been where, lots of fun. Where do people find you on the social medias? I am Dan Povenmire on TikTok. I'm and Dan Povenmire on uh, YouTube, and I'm Dan Povenmire on Instagram. And to clarify, is that I may be Dan P-O- dot Povenmire on Instagram. Is that P O V I M I E R E? It is not that, and it is not. It is also not spelled Pony Mice. Yes. How, how is that spelled for people? P O V E N M I R E. 
But uh, if you look okay. up the creator of Phineas and Fer- Ferb, I'll show very, you. Probably, very straightforward. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's so. pretty easy to find you because you're so damn awesome. <laughs> um, you can always get me at Stephen Glickman, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Glickman on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and then on TikTok, it's Stephen K. Glickman. What about you, Mike, you son of a bitch? At Mike Black is back on all social media. Mm-hmm. Excellent. All right. Oh, and, yes, uh, Matt. Matt Walker. How can people find you? Oh, uh, Links to everything at funnymat.com. Or if you're upset by me in any way, please let me know at mattwalkersucks.com. What about Glazer? <laughs> Glazer, where can people get you? Uh, on Instagram, at Glazer, boo hoo hoo. And I have a bunch of stand-up dates. So if you're in Alaska, Austin, San Francisco, St. Louis, and more, uh, check it out. That would nice. be weird if I was in all of those places really <laughs> yeah. soon. I was like, oh, wow, I'm like, I'm like following you like the Grateful Dead. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, The Nighttime Show. Go check it out. Love you guys. Thanks, man. Nighttime Show.